Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Tampa. Welcome to Grace and Faith. Tampa's renowned and known for specifically Grace and Faith Church. I believe you. Hey, that's a faith statement. <laughs> <laughs> so you wrote this book. How long did it take you to write the book? Oh, goodness. It took, um, it, from start to finish, I would say it was about a year and a half process. A year and it a half was process. Quick. Very quickly. Yes. I'm going to jump here. I want to make sure everybody knows how they can purchase a copy of your book. So just tell the congregation today uh, what the deal is and what they would get if they purchase a book online, is it? Yes, yeah, so you can email um, info at christybeam.com and just request, say, my name is so-and-so and, -so and um, I would like to purchase a book and we will get one, I will get one personalized and sent out to you and with that comes a couple of things, but one is a really very sweet gift from Annabelle um, and it tells you in the gift why we're sending those out to people and why we want those, those gifts to be a part of your life um, as well as ours. So, Tell us, let's start from the beginning, what happened that you first started to realize your daughter, Annabelle, now Annabelle is the second oldest Correct. of your three daughters. You have three girls. Yes. Blessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very. So uh, Abigail's the oldest and Adeline mm -hmm. is the youngest. What happened that you started to notice that uh, Annabelle wasn't well? Well, when Annabelle was four, she started just complaining about her stomach, and she would say, you know, my tummy hurts, Mommy, my tummy hurts. Um, and she was not eating as much as she had typically eaten. But the, the greatest sign was that by the time she would go to bed at night, her belly would be so distended, um, literally from underneath, you know, the, from the sternum to the top of the pubic bone, it would just be um, horrifically, grossly, rounded and almost looked as if she was pregnant when she was four and five years old. And that was when um, I finally, you know, was like, oh, we got to get some help. So, and the pain, she was just in great pain, pain. all the time. You said she was four years old when she first started to have these pains. Yes. There is a clip in the movie, it even came up in the official trailer, uh, where the family's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And before they diagnosed her, tell us what happened up to and prior to the diagnosis. Annabelle had actually um, gone in for a scoping, an upper GI small bowel follow through. And so they had given her bowel prep. Annabelle drank the bowel prep and started vomiting and didn't go to the bathroom, which is what the bowel prep is supposed to make you do. So we took her to the emergency room, ended up four times in a two-day time span. Um, she drank the full bowel prep. They did the scope on her. The doctor came out and said, she's fine. She's great. Mom, there's nothing wrong with her. And I looked at him and I said, what? And he said, this is the part where you're happy. This is the part where it's good news. This is the part where you smile. And he sent us home. Well, that night, Annabelle was in horrific agony. So we took her back to the hospital for the fourth time in two days. A different doctor said, oh, you know that bowel prep? It can make them really nauseated. We'll give her some Zofran and send her home. I lost it. Now, that's the part in the movie where Jennifer Garner gets real testy. Very. And she nearly devours the doctor. Mm-hmm. I got to tell you, I love that part of the movie. It's great. I love it because we've all been there, mm -hmm. right? I mean, nobody knows their body better than themselves or know what their child's going through better than a mom who's up at night watching the kid cry in agony. Oh, yeah. And here's some doctor saying, uh, she's good. Yeah. Mom, it's really all in your head. You're yeah. overplaying this. So Jennifer, I got to be careful what I say here. I'm in church. Yes. She really lets go and has at him. Mm -hmm. Please, please, please tell me that's what you did. I did. I did. I, um, I didn't, I wasn't physically standing um, because I was sitting in the chair and Annabelle was laid across me um, coming in and out of, you know, 
awareness. And so she was very, 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 very sick in my arms, but I did. I, I didn't stand and, and get in his face, but I think if I could have, I would have. But I did. I said those very exact words because we were told she's lactose intolerant. She's, um, you know, got reflux. I mean, we, we were told all those things, and she's just, just, you know, it's the bowel prep. I mean, just, right. and I did. And, and, and let me be quick to say, added to my comment, please, please, please tell me that's what you did. The reason why I say that is sometimes in life you have to fight. Mm-hmm. Christians don't understand that even Jesus said, since the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been suffering violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, we're not talking about the kind of violence we see uh, masking behind some uh, religious organizations, but we're talking about a tenacity a determination. And if you're going to be a Christian while Jesus is holding your hand and he'll go through everything with you, sometimes there is a fight in life and we have to be prepared for that fight. And so the tenacity that was displayed, that's what I get excited about because we need to stand up not only in the natural but sometimes in the spiritual and say, no, enough is enough. The promise of God says this, this, and this. This is what God says he'll do. I want my miracle. Mm -hmm. Now, you were doing that in the natural, and no doubt you guys were praying a whole heap. Mm -hmm. Now, before I ask you another question, I do want to say that the comments I made are with no disrespect to the medical profession. Absolutely not. You know, personally, I, I made that comment And I want you to know, I have the highest respect for men and women Mm -hmm. who give their lives for a ministry that is very unique and very hard, working with sick people all the time, can be very demanding. And so if we have any nurses, if we have any doctors, if we have any people from the medical profession here, please hear it straight from my mouth and from my heart. What would we do without you? We appreciate it so much. Absolutely. So in this case, you know, they would have seen some moms that are just overreactive, but this was one of those cases that was very real. So uh, you insisted, I assume, you're not leaving the hospital till they find out what's wrong with your daughter. And at that point, he was willing to do anything to get you out of the hospital. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> After my little fit, all he said was, okay, sure, Mom, we'll run some tests. He was so angry. Right. Um, and they did, and they were not expecting to find what they found. So what did they find? They found that Annabelle was actually 100% completely obstructed abdominally. They said, the surgeon said that on one side of the obstruction, it was the size of his fist, and on the other side, it was half the size of his pinky. They expected that there would be dead bowel because of the length of time that she was obstructed with no release, and they expected um, her to need, um, it's called a resection and all this other stuff, but they expected it, it to be really bad, colostomy bags, I mean. Right. Yeah. So colostomy bag, for those who may not be familiar, obviously they have to bypass intestines and the route to the bowel, Mm -hmm. and the bag has to be emptied on a regular basis. That just becomes a permanent part of her. My goodness, a four-year-old girl, Mm -hmm. you're her mom, your husband Kevin is there. I mean, this has got to rip your heart out. Oh, it was horrific. And... Um, you know, Kevin is such a sweet, sweet, patient, soft, gentle spirit. And when I got so upset and angry at the doctor, you know, you could see him like, have you lost your mind? What is wrong with you? I mean, I was like, ah! And um, he's sitting there going, oh, this is so embarrassing. Um, but, but he, I think, you know, he's a veterinarian, so he is in the medical field. So he, he I think, knew but didn't want it to be so. I, right. I think that's how he addressed it. But 
um, when the doctor came in and put his shoulder, his hand on Kevin's shoulder and patted him and said, I am so sorry. Um, and he told us that she was completely obstructed and that they were assembling a team of the best surgeons and the surgeon would be in to speak with us. And, um, you know, then they said that they had to put a tube down her right then and begin to pass the tube and they asked Kevin to hold her down. And I will never forget him standing over her and, and her crying. She was so weak she couldn't really fight and just saying, Daddy, why are they doing this to me? And he just um, held her and cried and said, Baby, I know, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And, you know, at one moment there was peace because they finally found and my prayer was, let what is hidden be revealed. But in the next moment, I'm thinking, I prayed for this. Um, this is what I wanted. This was the outcome. And, um, and it just was the first day of many days like that. Now, I have to say, Martin Henderson <laughs> played the role of Kevin. And I remember vividly that point when the doctor brings the diagnosis. They were very apologetic afterwards. They told you, uh, in real life, mm -hmm. be prepared, you're going to be here a very long time. So they weren't going to get rid of you. No. But Martin Henderson, who played that role, I thought he did a phenomenal job. Knowing from the movie, your husband was a veterinarian, he speaks out the diagnosis. And you could see on his face, if you haven't seen the movie, you've got to get the movie. All right? You really do. It's brilliant. You can see the realization and the yes. implication being painted on his face. He knows what this is about, and you're quizzical. You're looking, and Jennifer plays it very well. It's like, yeah, okay, what does this mean? And then Martin Henderson explains it to Jennifer Garner, playing yes. your role. Brilliant. I thought it was captured so well. So and then watching... Uh, Martin hold down little Annabelle mm -hmm. and uh, I could only imagine I know me I'm a, I'm a bit of a softy uh, I would have been crying my eyes out mm -hmm. I remember our son had fallen he was about four years old in the house split his head open mm -hmm. on a step and they used a fish hook uh, needle mm -hmm. to stitch it together and they didn't knock him out they just locally anesthetized uh, yeah. They treated it, and uh, my little boy is crying, and he's saying, am I going to die? Oh. You know, and your heart's just breaking. This, mm -hmm. I mean, the trauma, the pain, the fear, mm -hmm. everything. Uh, in the movie, it looks like it happened about nine months. Mm -hmm. How long did this go on for? Four and a half years. Now, four and a half years, in and out of the hospital, you're traveling to Boston, the movie only shows Boston, but later the surgeon, this amazing doctor, the specialist, Nur Dr. Nurko, Samuel Nurko. Dr. Nurko. Later, there was a hospital closer to your home, and one of his uh, students, associates? Yes, he trained this guy, um, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, and he trained him up in, in Dr. Nurko's ways, and Dr. Siddiqui could have gone anywhere in the world and he went to Austin, Texas, two hours from us. So awesome. they were it was as if the hands of Dr. Nurko were were still wrapped around Annabelle when we weren't with him. Right. Um, he worked through Siddiqui to help us. Now f for our benefit, and this is something I didn't pick up in the movie. If it's in there I didn't pick it up. Your daughter had two mm -hmm. incurable mm -hmm. life threatening diseases. Either one of them could have taken her life. Yes. And would have taken her life. Yes. What are they? We're going to put them on the screen in a moment, but what are those two diseases? Um, pseudo obstruction motility disorder and the second one is antral hypomotility disorder. And uh, fairly rare? Oh, very each one. rare. Mm -hmm. And yes. now I assumed because they're associated mm -hmm. I assume that they normally travel together. Yeah. But then I found out from you, they don't. They do not, no. Um, it's not normal for a child to have pseudo-obstruction and also have antral. And, and that just means 
that her intestines did not work, but her stomach did not work either. So the stomach, as the muscle was weak and floppy, it didn't have the ability to squeeze really hard and push the food through to the intestines. The intestines didn't have the strength to reach up and pull the food from the stomach and squeeze it through and out. So that's why she would distend as if she was so as nine months pregnant. Um, and that's why also she would eat four crackers and a cup of water and be full. It just, it wasn't worth the pain to eat. So all the time that she was in the hospital, as you traveled to Boston and then um, Austin, Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, they fed her intravenously, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. All right. And uh, in the movie, we see at home, mm -hmm. uh, there's a tube down her nose. Mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't fed that way at home? No. So how did you feed her at home? She, she ate very little. They had her on um, Ensure shakes and mm -hmm. um, even sometimes, you know, uh, any, any shake. They said they were typically geriatric type shakes mm -hmm. for, for older people, but anything they could get down her with rich nourishment. Um, but even those would sit heavy on her. She just hardly ever right. ate. I, I want to make a footnote here. Yes. When you said geriatric shakes, I said yes, as if I know, and I do know, <laughs> I'm not a geriatric. <laughs> I just want to make that clear. There may be a few grays, but they deny my age. Okay, so uh, this is a daily routine. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, uh, I, no one, unless you live through it, no one can imagine, mm -hmm. no matter how vivid one's imagination is, all the implications and how it totally would change the dynamics mm -hmm. of how the Beam family did life. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, she was on 10 medications and she took those 10 several times throughout the day. So every two to three hours I was dosing her with something. Um, she couldn't ever be on any pain medication that truly made a difference because most pain medications that work slow down your GI tract and they slow down the bowel. So they couldn't put her on anything that would actually help the pain. So she was usually hovering around a level 9, 10 pain all the time. And she just lived her life on the sofa in the fetal position with a heating pad on her stomach. Um, when she wasn't there, she was in the ERs, the procedure rooms, the the surgery centers, they did uh, a Botox injection on her pylorus at one point to try to open it up to stop the contraction. You know, I mean, it just, they tried everything they could. She was always having something done to her, needles or tubes down her nose. Or, and, and the crazy part about it is we had two other children who deserved for us to sew into their lives sure. as much as we spent with Anna, and, sure. and that's so hard to do when you have a chronically ill child. I can only imagine this level of intensity, this level of trauma, mm -hmm. this level of tension uh, could wreak havoc on families. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were talking last night, you shared with me uh, an interesting fact about statistics mm -hmm. about couples who go through this. Would you tell the congregation? Yes, um, actually I'll never forget when the doctor called and he told me Annabelle did for sure have pseudo obstruction motility disorder. They did what's called a manometry testing and that's what, um, it's very invasive and that's how they diagnosed it. But, but what he said was, um, I'm first very sorry to inform you that she does in fact have pseudo obstruction motility disorder. Um, I'm sorry for that for Annabelle, and I'm sorry for that for you and Kevin, because you seem like good people, and I wish you the very best. Most marriages with children with this disorder end in divorce, and so I wish you the very best. And in that very phone call, I felt like I was given a life sentence for my child and a life sentence on my marriage. And we are thrilled to say you and Kevin are still famously in love. Yes, he's so great. He stole your heart, Throb. Yes. That's awesome. Praise God. Come on, give the Lord a hand Yay. for that. That's awesome. Fantastic. In the movie, Annabelle makes a statement mm -hmm. that would crush any parent. I don't think there's a parent alive who would ever want to hear these words? 
I want to ask you, I know you know what the question is, and I'll say it in a moment, what a statement is. Did Annabelle say to you in real life, at any point, Mommy, I want to die and go to heaven and be with Jesus? Absolutely. The last time we were in Boston, we didn't know it would be our last time, but um, we had gone for what we thought was a routine checkup, and the doctor saw her and immediately said, I am so sorry. I don't like what I see. She's going to have to go inpatient. I thought, oh, not again. And Annabelle was like, oh, I thought I was doing okay. And they're like, no, baby, you're not. So she went in patient, and um, Annabelle was always, you know, in pain and in agony, but she suffered with such grace and dignity with a disorder that leaves you with very little dignity. And um, she decided that particular time she was done, and she literally turned and looked at me with her sweet, sweet face and, and said, you know, Mommy, I just want to die, and I want to go to heaven and be with Jesus where there's no more pain. And I, I will never forget it. And, it. and and I looked at her, and I just said, Baby, Daddy and I would be so, our hearts would be so sick and so broken without you. Um, and she just, it, doesn't, it didn't matter. She just was done. She was ready to go. She wouldn't get out of bed. She wouldn't go to the restroom. She wouldn't eat. She wouldn't drink. She literally laid there and died, tried to die. And you were saying that she looked so sick mm -hmm. that she was pale as oh. anything. And that's the point in the movie. And of course, the movie can only capture a fraction of everything that went on. Uh, the movie doesn't put it together like this, but that's the point in the movie where you rang Kevin and, well, you rang Kevin in real life. Yes. But Kevin heard how poorly Annabelle was doing and said, that's it. He grabbed the two girls, went to the airport. All the credit cards are maxed out, right? Yes. And um, he was determined to bring the two girls and himself to the hospital in Boston mm -hmm. to somehow cheer up Annabelle. She's doing so poorly. Yes. At the airport, what happened? Because that was real, not just mm -hmm. seeing it on the movie. That happened. Tell the people what happened. Well, um, they were in the truck on the way to the airport, and Kevin starts pulling credit cards out of his wallet, and he's handing them to Abby as he's driving. And so you have to remember that Abby is 11, and she's learning how uh, severely financially strapped and struggling we are because she would read off the credit card number. Kevin would read it to the person over the phone and say, I need to buy three plane tickets, it's an emergency. And they would say, I'm sorry, sir, your credit card's maxed out. In fact, he had one gentleman lecture him. He said, do you have any idea how much money you owe? Do you have any idea You're how maxed kidding. out? No, no. This is someone at the airport. No, well, this was a person on the end of the credit card side. Right. And so they were just like, no, we won't give you more limit on your card. Do you right. realize how in debt you are? Um, but then he finally got a hold of a person and told him the situation and they said, you know what, you'll get an overage fee for going over your limit, but um, we'll let you buy the tickets. And so... So it finally went through. It went through. And so in the movie, this is when he calls, he's talking to Annabelle. Mm -hmm. The movie says she didn't want to take a shower. Mm -hmm. And he says, hey, baby girl, you really need to take a shower. I mm -hmm. can smell you from all the way out mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And they burst into mm -hmm. the room. And all of that was because she was so sick. Mm -hmm. She was not responding. Mm -hmm. And Kevin just did the, what every dad should do in a situation like that, became a superhero, mm -hmm. grabbed the, old, the other two girls, and came to your side. What happened to Annabelle? Did it have an effect on her? Oh, my goodness. She was, um, I was sitting there reading, um, and she was sitting up in bed and playing with her little dolls that she was playing with. And we have a picture of her, and her face is just lit up, and she's just, and then she turns to Abby and, and Kevin and Adeline, and he goes, wait a minute, what are you doing here? I'm in Boston. And um, they said, uh, we've come to take you home. And she said, oh, well, I'm so happy you're here. And then Abby, who's the oldest and quite persuasive, said, um, Annabelle, show me the playroom. And she said, no. 
I don't want to get out of bed and show you the playroom. And she said, oh, you're going to get out of bed, and you're going to show me the playroom. And Abby got her out of that bed, and that was the first time she'd just gotten out and walked. And they went to the playroom, and they played. And it was that turn. She turned the corner, yeah. and we got to go home. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Now, so you had just heard your daughter saying, Mommy, I want to die. Oh, yeah. Ten days later, mm -hmm. it's as if those dreadful words came to pass. Oh, yes. So, we're at a critical point in the story. Your daughter just said, Mommy, I want to die. I want to go be with Jesus. I don't want to be in pain anymore. Mm -hmm. Your heart's breaking. You're explaining to her, Babe, that's going to kill Daddy and me and mm -hmm. your sisters. You bring your husband. He does the super dad thing. I love that. I mean, every man should be like that. That is awesome. It is. doesn't matter what it costs. Brilliant. You guys go home. Ten days later, something happens that makes this whole story take another turn. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, you had a cottonwood tree mm -hmm. that was pretty much dead. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to have a bit of a property, and the girls used to go climbing. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Abigail, the oldest, had encouraged Annabelle to come on outside, come on, let's go climb the tree, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they went climbing the tree. Mm -hmm. And we see it on the movie, is great. What happens? Uh, the tree branch starts to break, mm -hmm. and Annabelle backs up and falls into the hollow of the tree. Mm -hmm. Your daughter, Abigail, comes to tell you. Mm -hmm. From that point on, what does your daughter tell you? What are you thinking, and what took place? Well, Abby was frantic, and she ran inside, and she was screaming, Mommy, Annabelle's fallen in the tree, she's fallen in the tree, and she's come, you've got to come, come quick, and I didn't even grab my cell phone. Um, I was thinking, because she was so sickly and weak, and she hadn't climbed trees in, in a year. I mean, she just, they used to climb trees before she got sick, too sick, hadn't been climbing trees. So I thought, mm, she's climbed a little too high, and she's stuck, and needs help maneuvering down. Um, so, but still, I was hurrying. Um, but Abby was literally physically dragging me, and Abby's 11 at the time, and she's hysterical. And I'm like, baby, I'm, I'm coming. It's going to be fine. We're he, she's like, no, you don't understand. Um, I get out to the tree, and Adeline, who's seven, has a, a metal rod, and she is digging furiously at the base of this tree. And I said, Adeline, what are you doing, baby? And she said, Annabelle can't breathe, Mommy. She needs air. I'm going to dig her out. And I said, what? And I'm looking in the tree, and I'm looking around, and I said, where is Annabelle? And at the same time, in unison, it was like everything stopped, and they said, she's in the tree. And they pointed to the bottom of the bark on this massive cottonwood tree. And then Abby jerked me around and pointed 30 feet in the air, and there was a hole about this big. And Abby said, she went in that hole and fell to the bottom. And like that, Abby had scurried back up the tree and was up there with her. And Abby's just screaming blood red in the face, Anna, Anna, answer me, Anna. Totally non-responsive. 30 feet inside the hollow of a tree. It is not going to have clean edges. It's going to be jagged and who knows what. This kid has got to have broken bones, concussion. Mm -hmm. Only God knows if mm -hmm. she'd even come out able to walk again. Absolutely. 30 feet. 30 feet. Through the hollow of a tree, mm -hmm. that in itself is crazy. Oh, yes. So here's this kid, got two life-threatening, incurable diseases. Four years of hell, mm -hmm. literally, for the whole family, especially for her. Mm -hmm. Ten days earlier, I want to die. I want to be with Jesus. I don't want to be in pain. Now your little girl falls through the tree. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. We have a video clip, not from the movie, but from the 700 Club, mm -hmm. because your story's been told on the 700 Club. We have a short uh, video clip, and we're going to show that right now. We're going to dim the lights. This is the tree 
and the rescue. All right. Eight-year-old Annabelle had fallen into a hollowed out cottonwood tree she and her sister had been climbing and plunged 30 feet to the bottom. Christy called her husband, Kevin, who raced home to try to save his daughter. They wanted more than anything in the world to just reach right down and grab that little girl and, and bring her up into my arms, and it was physically impossible. Meanwhile, Christy called 911. Kevin looked for signs that his daughter was alive. One of the most beautiful moments in my life was she just raised her little left arm and then put it back down. And I knew at that point that she was alive. The volunteer fire department arrived and quickly assessed the situation. We could see her with flashlights enough to, uh, to uh, enough of her body to be able to see that she didn't have any, didn't appear to have any major hemorrhaging. Still, the rescue would take time and extreme caution. Because of the dynamic of the tree, because the tree was rotten, we didn't want to risk cutting anything out because we were afraid things would start falling in on her. After nearly four hours, rescue workers pulled her out of the tree. I was happy, I was grateful they got her out. Thank you, God, thank you, God. She looked perfect. We were all very, very excited and very ecstatic that she was not uh, harmed any worse than she was. No broken bones, no paralysis was nothing short of miraculous. Even the doctors who examined her at the hospital had no explanation why she wasn't severely injured. The doctor said, you know, Mom, um, Jesus must have been with that little girl in that tree because we don't ever have anybody fall 30 feet and not suffer paralysis or broken bones. That's amazing. That's incredible. We mm -hmm. could thank God. That's, that in itself was an amazing miracle. Absolutely. Now, I got to say again, even with this clip, this is from the 700 Club and not the movie, but even in this clip, we hear Kevin saying, you know, he saw, you know, Annabelle raise her mm -hmm. hand. But talking to you, I find out that really, for a long period, there was no response whatsoever. No, and we think, we honestly believe that was God's way of speaking to Kevin because he was screaming at the top of that ladder, ladder and he doesn't get upset and yell ever, but he in this scream that none of us have ever heard, he's yelling, Annabelle, raise your hand. And I am telling you, I didn't see it. He said it, but he said it. She's laying there slumped over in the fetal position and very robotic. She just goes like this. Never looked up, never raised her eyes. Kevin said he felt that was God's way of saying, she's not dead. And so Kevin, the fire trucks came and Kevin just, that's what he needed. He needed that nugget to hold on to that she's, that she's live. Uh, but the firefighters could not ever get her to respond after that. And they didn't know what in the world they were going to do because they could not send a man down after her and they could not cut the tree down. And she was absolutely non-responsive. So in the movie, it shows a firefighter going down mm -hmm. the tree, but they could not even get down the hole because it was so restricted. Correct. And this kid falls through this narrow restriction. Yes. No broken bones, nothing. I mean, that alone is a story. That alone uh, is a miracle. That's incredible. So they could get no response from her for a long oh, time. Yes, a long time. Eventually they did, and then they get complete response from her. But while she was in the tree, mm -hmm. Annabelle claims, and I believe this, I've, I've interviewed many stories like this. And folks, if you have trouble theologically understanding this, I tell you, okay? I have a doctorate of ministry. I've interviewed many people who have had life after death experiences. This is real, okay? Annabelle suddenly sees herself leaving her body. Mm -hmm. She could see herself laying there. That's the description we get all the time. Mm -hmm. Next thing, she's in this bright area, mm -hmm. and whose lap is she sitting on, or who is she with? Yeah, she said um, that she woke up in heaven, and she was just sitting in Jesus' lap. And um, she said that she told him that she wanted to stay. And he said, I know you do, Annabelle, but I have plans for you on earth that you cannot fulfill in heaven. But when the firefighters get you out, there will be nothing wrong with you.
Praise God. And one of my other favorite things that she said was, um, she said, do you know, Mommy, do you know God told me no? And I said, oh, the very idea. And she said, I said, what did he tell you no about? She said, I asked if I could see the creatures. And he said, no, it was not my time. And I, being an idiot, said, what creatures? And she said, Mommy, you know, the ones with the body of a lion and the head of an eagle. From the book of Revelation. Well, I didn't know about that then. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little slow. Actually, when you told me this last night, I didn't know about it either. Yeah. I had to go home and read it. <laughs> you feel better now? It makes you feel a lot better. <laughs> but I, I mean, amazing. Right. It is amazing. It is amazing, and there's so much of this. I wish we had two hours to sit here and talk because there is so much to this story. Get the movie, it's brilliant. And no, these aren't ads. I love to see the gospel shared in many different ways. And this is a brilliant tool to let your friends know there is a God and miracles happen and heaven is for real. Uh, and that's why I'm promoting it, you know. Uh, but And the book is... So much more information in the book. I, I absolutely loved sitting down with you last night and with uh, uh, Haas and Linda and hearing details. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some of the details that I uncovered when I was researching some of your interviews and things like that, we talked about this last night. Annabelle saw Mimi mm -hmm. in heaven. Mm -hmm. Who's Mimi? Mimi is Kevin's... Um, father's mother, so it would have been Annabelle's grandmother, or, okay. and so she called, we called her Mimi, and she had passed away about a year prior, um, and that was truly the first r girl's first real experience with death, um, and Annabelle just said uh, one day, just very, just out of the blue, she said, you know, Mommy, I saw Mimi in heaven. And I said, really? And she said, yes, but I didn't recognize her at first. She looked so much younger. You see, the aging process, medically speaking, as we are aging, our body is dying. Mm -hmm. And when God created us, before the fall, we were never meant to die. Mm -hmm. And so in heaven, there is no curse. And so the effects of the curse, ladies, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you're 70 or 80 and maybe have a couple of little lines in your face, when you get to heaven, they're gone. <laughs> it's in the Bible <laughs> in a roundabout way. So here's Mimi. Mimi's younger, mm -hmm. uh, so she had trouble recognizing her at first, but she recognized Mimi. Mm -hmm. There was another person she saw. Mm -hmm. Now this is even more sensitive, and uh, for those of you that are about to hear this, this is a good thing. It may move you because maybe you've experienced a, a miscarriage. I believe you had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. uh, one being a viable birth, and you lost the baby. Uh, Annabelle was how old when she went to heaven? Uh, she was nine. She was nine years old. Mm -hmm. What did she tell you? Yeah, she told me, um, you know, Mommy, I saw this little girl in heaven, and she looked just like you and Abby. So I asked God, who is that little girl? And he said, Anna, that is your sister. And I thought, wow, that life, that creation that I so selfishly missed and longed for has been sitting in the lap of the Lamb of God, being loved by Jesus while I have selfishly yearned for that child on earth. She's been in the, the greatest place, being loved by the greatest giver of love in yeah. life. Yeah. Awesome. The Bible says that there will be no tears in heaven. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, for anyone who has had the misfortune of having lost a child like that, they're innocent in his sight, and they are precious mm -hmm. in his sight. And uh, they're waiting for you. You just need to make sure that you've prepared your salvation and that you've asked Christ in your heart so that you can be reunited. But I, I think that is fantastic. That is awesome. And here's your little girl experiencing the other side of death. She saw death in her grandma on earth. And, you know, you told me how she's trying to, all the girls are trying to understand, well, yeah. we put grandma on the ground, but grandma's really in heaven. And, mm -hmm. And Annabelle has this glorious, amazing wow. experience of seeing Mimi yeah. on the other side and now being able to reconcile, yes, there is a heaven mm -hmm. and our loved ones who know Christ are there. Absolutely. That is, that, isn't that incredible? Yeah, that is awesome. That is fantastic. Brilliant. We have a, a small clip, uh, again, I think from the 700 Club, uh, Annabelle, you're going to get to see Annabelle. Oh. How many of you want to see Annabelle? Yeah. All right, we're going to get to see Annabelle for a brief second here. Uh, again, I believe this is from the 700 Club. They believe there was another miracle that day. Annabelle told her mom that at one point she met Jesus. Whenever I was in that tree, I went to heaven. And I remember it was really bright. And I saw my Mimi, who had died a couple of years back, and that's how I knew I was in heaven. And I sat on Jesus' lap, and he said, whenever the firefighters get you out, there will be nothing wrong with you. Awesome. So incredible. So all of a sudden, in the middle of this rescue, finally, Annabelle starts to respond to the firefighters. Mm -hmm. They can't get down there. They don't want to cut the tree. They don't know if it's going to implode on her. Right. She starts to respond, and they made a harness mm -hmm. that she could sit in, mm -hmm. and they start giving her directions. Mm -hmm. What happened? Explain to, yeah, to they, the congregation. They made a harness out of the ropes, and they lowered the ropes, and they were screaming, Annabelle, Annabelle, grab the rope, grab the rope, when she began to respond. And they said she was so calm and so peaceful. She never cried. She never said, where is my mommy? She meticulously followed their directions. She, Annabelle, put your left foot here, put your left arm here, put your right foot here, put your right arm here, meticulously did as directed and assisted in her own rescue. And if it wasn't for her ability to do that, they, they still do not know how they would have gotten her out. Now listen to this. 30 feet down the hollow of a tree, the only little place that light could have come in was where the branch had been broken off. Yeah. Uh, light would have come in on an angle, but she's 30 feet down. Right. How did she see the harness? Mm -hmm. How was she able to do all of this in virtual pitch darkness? Mm -hmm. Tell them. So Annabelle shared with me that um, whenever she was in heaven and God told her that it was time that uh, he, she had to go, he said, but Annabelle... Um, I'm going to send my guardian angel, your guardian angel to be with you and light the tree and be with you. And she said she woke up in the tree and there was um, an angel. But she said it was small, like a fairy, because God wanted it to fit in the tree with me. And I said, did y'all talk? What did you say? And she looked at me like I was crazy. Is she... We just sat there peacefully together. Like, what is the matter with you? Have you not ever had a heaven experience? I'm like, no, I don't know. I mean, I... Yeah, she just said, we just sat there peacefully together. Us grown-ups are so dense, yeah, right? I know. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know. I talked to my angel, but, but yeah, and, and it lit the tree. And, and, and that, she said, that's why I was so peaceful. <laughs> we get too educated. If I was in the tree and I saw an angel the size of a little fairy, I yeah. would have been rebuking it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> get out of here in Jesus' name. <laughs> it's like, I'm here in Jesus' name. <laughs> 
That's why he said you got to have faith like a little child. That's right. Yeah. So Annabelle's rescued. Hurrah, hooray, phenomenal, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But she's a sick little girl. Uh -huh. What happens? They whisk her out of the tree, strap her to a board. She and I take off on care flight. Um, we land. We get her in the, the room, and they begin... <laughs> and it's not funny, but they cut off her clothes. You know, again, her, her belly is very distended, and they cut off her clothes, and she's very unhappy because her favorite butterfly shirt's getting cut in two, and she's, like, ripping into them about it. And uh, they begin to do one test after another after another, and um, she's wet, muddy, has scratches on her, and a few bruises, but they finally come in after hours of testing, and... Uh, minor concussion, they said, possibly, but um, no broken bones, no paralysis, um, absolutely no major injuries from the fall. And um, as we literally sat there w waiting with her, her little tummy begins to go down very slowly and ever so slightly. And the next, and they kept her overnight because they, they just couldn't believe there wasn't something wrong with her from the fall. And so the next morning I go in with, because that's what we do. We get put in the hospital and we stay for a week. So I pack the hospital bag. Kevin stayed with her for the night. And I went up there to relieve him with the bags. She's sitting on the end of the bed, kicking her feet. Kevin's sitting on the couch. And she is just chip, 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 talking. <laughs> and she is a totally different child. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So how long did it take for it to dawn on you all that this kid is healed? Well, you know, that next day, I, Annabelle had shared a lot of the tree, the heaven experience with me. And so I actually said it to Kevin's mom, who is a, an amazing godly woman. And when I said it to her, she looked at me and she said, Christy, you know what that means, right? And I said, no. And she said, it means she's been healed. And so we had that in the back of our minds, but I couldn't grasp it. I couldn't let myself go there because what if she hadn't? Right. And I accepted that she had, and then I had to go all the way back and learn how to recope again with right. a sick child. Sure. And so it was just a matter of days, though, that she was eating and laughing and playing and jumping and... and no the, pain. No pain. And the true medical uh, documentation is that two weeks later, it was time for her to rotate on to a very powerful medication that she would rotate on and off. And it was time to give it to her. And I called the doctor and I said, you know, she doesn't seem to need it. And he said, okay, you know, if you don't want to give it to her today or tomorrow, that's fine. But she'll need it. So, but that's okay. You can wait a day or two. Never gave her that medication ever again. Never again. Mm -mm. So how long has Annabelle been medication-free? Oh, goodness. She is, oh, where are we now? Oh, gosh. It took a year to wean her off everything. Right. Um, so has it, what, three years now? Three years, no medication. Mm -hmm. And you said she makes up for all the food she didn't eat. Oh, my eat. goodness. That kid is hilarious. And guess what her, I mean, what, guess what she can chow down on more than anything? What? Yes. Pizza. Pizza. <laughs> They read the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's an interesting part to this story, and we're going to conclude here. Obviously, this young lady had an amazing miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, have a quick video clip of this. This is a very short clip from CBN again, 700 Club. Everyone say thank you, 700 Club. Thank you, 700 Club. All right, let's dim the lights. Doctors had no answer for why Annabelle showed no signs of her ailments. They started slowly taking her off medications. We dropped one medication after another away, and Annabelle ended up on, she's on zero medications today. She doesn't go to a specialist anymore. She doesn't go to doctors for medication anymore. Um, she's been released. And that's Dr. Samuel Nurko in Boston. Awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. Now, 
this is that special thing. When you guys were filming, mm -hmm. you remembered that Dr. Nurko had sent a package. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you turned to your husband. <laughs> now, this is, this package had been sitting up in the attic. The attic for quite a period of time. This is quite some time later. Yes. But you remember during the filming that he sent this package, and in all the things that happened, it ended up in the attic. You get this box. What was in the box? What was in the box is what we called liquid gold. It was a medicine called Cisapride. It's taken off the market in the United States, but Dr. Nurko is granted the ability by the FDA to prescribe it for children like Annabelle. So it's the only medication that can give them some semblance of normal life, but it had actually stopped helping Annabelle. So that's what it was. It was her round of Cisapride. So here's this box, and it was overnighted to your house December the 30th, her next round of medication. Yes. December the 30th, 10 days after Annabelle had said, I want to die and go be with Jesus, mm -hmm. December the 30th, she falls down the tree. Same day. Same day. Same day he overnights it, God says, enough. No more. And she never took another medication. And you guys didn't realize this till the filming stage. And this is in some of the background footage on some of the DVDs. And so you actually opened it there and then and noticed the date and yes. everything. What an amazing sense of humor God has. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that phenomenal? I'm going to say something that sounds like it's heresy. God is more human than you think. You see, what we identify as human qualities, really, reality is they are divine qualities. God is so much more caring, fun, understanding, compassionate than what we could ever imagine. We attribute these things to humanity, and some people are good at it, and some people really stink at it, but, but you never think of deity being that way. But anything that's good in man had its origin in God, and in God it's perfect. Yeah. That, 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 that is an amazing, I love it. Yeah. I see God's sense of humor all over that. Enough. I'll make sure this package gets hidden and they'll find it later and have a good laugh about it. Yeah. That is so brilliant. That is so brilliant. Would you put your hands together for Chrissy Beam and the family? <clears throat> oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Oh, thank you.